something's alive It just gets too late to learn Hi, I'm Howard Soons, the author of Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. And well, I'm lost somewhere. I must have made a few bad turns. And this is Play That Rock and Roll. This is not a test. This is Play That Rock and Roll. I'm your host, Joseph K, and like the song at the start says, just call me Joe. Today, our guest is Howard Soons, the author of Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. The new updated edition of the book was released just last year in 2021, and it brings the reader up to Bob Dylan's 80th birthday. Regular listeners of this show would know that my co-host Chris and I recently completed our Dylan Through the Decades mini-series that took a look back at Bob Dylan's full studio discography and major life events one decade at a time. The bulk of the research for that project was this book. And it is because of the extensive research in this book that I believe this is the best Dylan biography out there. In fact, I think it's one of the best music bios ever written. So I thought that interviewing the author of this book, and perhaps the most acclaimed Dylan biographer out there, would make for a great cap to our series. And since Chris co-hosted Dylan Through the Decades right along with me, I felt it would be only appropriate that he joined us in this conversation as well. So in this interview, we talk about the challenges Howard faced while originally writing this book. We talk about how he discovered that Bob Dylan had been secretly married in the 1980s. And he even tells us about his interactions with the notorious William Zanzinger, who Bob wrote about in his song, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll. Howard shares his thoughts on Bob's most recent output, he addresses his ongoing war of words with fellow Dylan author Clinton Halen. And finally, he talks about what Bob's music still means to him today. Again, the book is called Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. And the new updated edition brings the reader up to Bob's 80th birthday. You can get your copy of this new updated edition on Amazon. If you want to learn more about Howard and his other books, you can check out his website howardsoons.com. Howard is also on Twitter, at Howard Soons. So without further ado, here's the conversation Chris and I had with Howard Soons, author of Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. Got the, the new updated edition of the book right here. For my first question, let's go back to when you first decided to write down the highway. What was that time frame, and what made you decide this was the book you wanted to write? Well, I was a great lover of Bob Dylan's music from when I was a teenager. I first saw him live in 1981. And uh, by the time I was in my early 30s, I was a published author, and I was a full-time author. We had, I'd written a bestseller, I'd wrote, written a biography of Charles Bukowski, the American writer. So I was becoming established as a biographer and I wanted a new subject. And I had lunch with a publisher who said, well, you should do a Bob Dylan book because he's going to be 60 in 2001. And that's a big deal for the publishing industry that publishers love anniversaries. And so that gave me the idea that it was an opportunity, a business opportunity to write a book about someone who I had admired and followed and listened to since I was a teenager. And so that was how this, this, the process started in about 98, 1998. Okay. So it was about, it, it sounds like it was about a, a two year process or about how long did it take to research and, and collect all the data and get all your interviews? Uh, I guess from having the idea to actually doing, going on CNN in New York to publicize it, um, it was probably about two and a half years. Okay. Uh, interesting thing, you know, I, I kind of, 
I spent too much time doing the research. As you get older and you do more books, you learn how to do it a better job. You learn how to use, manage your time better. I spent, I really went to town on the research. I spent months in America, traveling around America, interviewing people, hundreds of people, driving all over America, flying all over America, backwards and forwards for months. And then I realized I had like hundreds and hundreds of audio tapes, which I hadn't dis transcribed yet. And I only had a certain number of months left to write the book. And so I, it all became a bit frantic to get the book ready for the deadline. But I did actually have great material because I got some wonderful material. But th that's a kind of a yin and yang thing. You know, I got, had, did really good research, but then I, I was sitting up at midnight writing this book um, <laughs> because I didn't leave myself enough time. Well, I can tell you that research really comes through in the pages. That's why we wanted to have you on the show. You know, we've been doing our Dylan mini series and your book has been the absolute backbone for our research. And uh, it's just one of the best rock bios I've ever read. And it, it, it makes me think, you know, one thing we've learned is, you know, Bob is such a private, you know, cloistered off uh, type of person. And you talked to so many people that were close to him. Generally speaking, did you find the people that were close to him that you spoke to willing and open to share their experiences and thoughts? Or were a lot of people more hesitant and guarded? And did you kind of have to coax things out of them? Well, you know, there's a, a whole range of experiences. Some people say no. Some people are very reluctant and very suspicious. And some people are very friendly and open. But broadly speaking, my uh, takeaway from, I, I mean, if you ask me about specific people, I can give you some good anecdotes about certain individuals. Um, but my, broadly speaking, my experience was that people around Bob Dylan are similar to him in character. They are freewheeling intellectuals, um, free, think, free, free thinkers who don't like being told what to do. And therefore, when you contact somebody from Greenwich Village in the 60s, who was Bob's mate then, and ask them for an interview, they won't clam up and get nervous. But they will either do it because they want to do it or they won't do it. But they, won't, they don't want permission. They don't seek permission because they are independent, intelligent, you know, minded people, so, which is different to doing most um, celebrity biographies because celebrities can be very very controlling paul mccartney for instance in my experience oh. is the opposite um but bob dylan also I, I gained the impression over these two or three years that bob dylan knew about the project right from the start because i contacted him right at the start and oh. he was indifferent to it he didn't care okay. he wasn't bothered he wasn't going to help he wasn't going to stop me and so i so the extraordinary situation arose that ultimately when i was in beverly hills sitting in a room with his children, talking about their dad. And I thought, well, Bob must know this. He must know I'm here with the kids. You know, I was expecting him to walk through the door any minute. Because uh, they were very frank and open. Um, but I, I think in retrospect, I, I'm sure he knew, but I, I think even if they asked him permission, they must have asked him. I think he must have said to them, it's up to you. It's just up to you. You know, you have to make your own decisions about this which is oh, very, okay. libera very liberating for the writer, very good experience for the biographer. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, I wonder if you had ever, you know, had any interaction or, or experience with him. It's, it, it seems to be quite in character for him to be totally sort of detached from that process. So one of the most notable aspects of Down the Highway is that you broke the story that Bob had been married secretly in the 80s to Carolyn Dennis, and, you know, that, that I know was a, a big selling point for your book. Can you talk about how you discovered that information and how you felt when you discovered that information? Well, um, first thing to say is that I'm a biographer and I, before that I was a newspaper journalist. And a lot of people who write Dylan books aren't journalists and they aren't really biographers. I mean, Clinton Halen isn't a biographer. He's a fan and fans write <laughs> Well, I mean, being serious, so fans just write yeah. books about what it's like to be a fan and your fan-like opinion of somebody's work, somebody who you love. But my working method is to investigate people 
and reveal their lives. That's and a biography is is the life of of an individual. It's not, you know, it's not um, it's not literary criticism necessarily. That can be part of it, but it's the life. It, biography is the life, and life involves childhood, marriage, mistresses, money, business, all of that stuff. And you have to vigorously drill down into all those areas and find out what's going on. And with Bob Dylan, for instance, there was rumors that he'd been had numerous lovers, wives, children. Extraordinary. I mean, Victor Mahmoud has said to me, you know, he's got a whole Shakespearean trip going on around him, all these women in his life and all these kids. But, you know, to pin it down to who these women are, who the kids are, who the wife is, was a process of just talking to everybody and then when I got a name, when I got some names, going to the public, you know, a few people tipped me off, essentially, basically confirmed it. But then to prove it, going downtown LA, public records office, in the basement of a building in, I think it was in Norwalk, suburban LA, um, this sort of bunker, this sort of concrete bunker, and going through public records until I found Robert Zimmerman's marriage to Carolyn Dennis. And then, of course, you've got the, then you just paid $10 for the, piece of paper and then you've got a red hot exclusive actually um, i mean the amazing thing about that was that a man so famous one of the most famous people in the world managed to be married and divorced and have a kid no one knew about right i mean that's that's pretty unusual yeah, I mean, yeah if, if, jack, if jack nicholson gets married and has a kid we, we all know about it right mm. if madonna gets married and has a kid we know about it bob dylan goes through this whole process <laughs> meets this woman, get, you know, gets married, has the child, gets divorced. No one knows. I mean, that's, that's really very revealing of him as a person. When you discover something like that, so what, can you talk about, is it a no-brainer right away to include it? You know, what, when, this is, I guess, a bigger question about journalism is, you know, what is your process for deciding what gets included in the overall story? You know, what is your discretion? Um, how does that factor into it? Well, I mean, I would, I think possibly things have changed slightly. This is over 20 years ago. Okay. Um, and things are different in the UK than in the US, um, oh. l legally, in terms of um, uh, what might be thought to be private. So there's, there's now more of an onus in the media on what is on privacy, and there are in fact privacy laws in the UK, which are different to laws in the US. Right. But at the time, there was certainly no legal reason not to publish something that was true. Mm -hmm. um, he had no real legal redress at the time. If it happened now, he may, you know, he may have gone after me. Although I, I don't think I don't think that's his character. But yeah. morally. If you're asking me whether I thought it was right or wrong, I had no hesitation in doing it because what you're doing is you're trying to tell the story of this man completely, honestly, fully. Um, and to leave out a marriage would be absurd. Right. So I'd have, I had no, no, no qualms about it. Before I did it, of course, I did, inf I did speak to Carolyn. I did ring her up. Um, I did tell her what I was going to do. She knew what I was going to do. Um, so I didn't do it blind. They had, they had notice and they didn't, oh, okay. they didn't try and stop me. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's good to hear. So when you're in the investigative process and, you know, you're hearing all these sort of rumors and maybe innuendo, you know, I, I have read a lot of other lesser rock biographies that, uh, include any salacious little detail. I did not find that. I did not experience that with your book. What it, what was it, would be your process for like verification if you heard a particularly, I don't know, juicy rumor? Well, it depends what it is. You know, um, some things, some things you have to prove, right. like a, a marriage. Some things are just. Um, observation you know if 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 you speak to bob dylan's bass player and he tells you a funny story about one day when they were hanging out and bob offered to buy him a birthday present and the bass player said wow what could it be bob dylan's going to buy me a present it might be a bag full of diamonds you know yeah. that, it turns out it gives him a bulletproof vest because um john lennon's just been shot right and, yeah and so this is, this is this is tim drummond tell me the story well you know there's no harm in that 
you know, I've got, I've got no hesitation. My instinct as a journalist tells me Tim Drummond is the guy on stage. He was there. I know he's the right guy. I'm looking him in the eye. He's not telling me a lie. He's got no reason to lie. It's not defamatory. It's not libelous. It rings true. It's amusing. It adds to the picture. So, you know, you make, you make these judgments all the time. Um, and people tell you things all the time. And you, but, you know, I, I mean, I'm in my 50s. I've been doing this for over 30 years. I know I, I, I can't, you kind of get, you have an instinct for people when people are lying to you. And very, very rarely, actually, do you get, you get caught out. Oh, very interesting. So I've had a, a number of biographers on, on this show before, and, and one thing that comes up a lot in the research process is, you know, especially when you're going pretty far back in time, you're sort of battling either people's hazy memories or, in some cases, trying to write their own narrative or conflicting stories, you know, about similar events. How do you navigate those challenges when writing a biography? Well, yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, everybody remembers things differently. And if you speak to five people who are at any one event in, in any point in time, they will all remember it differently and they all think they're right. That's, that's just human nature. That's human psychology. We yep. do that. I do it. You do it. You know, if I spoke to you about something happened in your childhood and your sibling and your mother, they'd all tell you a different version. Right? <laughs> So what, what you have to do is when you, when you have to kind of work out what, what, what version makes sense, because often the, some versions don't quite make sense. You know, people think they were younger than they were or they were in a different city. You know, some things can be established. You know, we know Bob's movements. We know his tour schedule. We know, you know, this, that and the other. So you can kind of some there's, there are there's evidence to back various versions up. Sometimes you just can't tell. I mean, for instance, with Bob Dylan, there's that whole thing about the motorcycle crash. Well, you know, there's so many versions of that. And I, and, and I did my very, very best to get to the bottom of it by speaking to people who, was at, who were actually there, like Sally Grossman, who was there when Bob, you know, when, when Bob came back kind of injured. Um, but, you know, you, sometimes you never, you can never really get to the truth. Um, and um, sorry, what was the other part of your question? But that's that, that's the thing about people, multiple. And of course, as time passes, uh, yes, the other thing you were saying, as time passes, it's certainly true that people tend to polish their memories. They tend to tell the same story again and again, anecdotally, and they kind of improve upon it. Yeah. And then you get to a point where you're not really hearing what really happened. You're kind of hearing this anecdote, which is like dinner party conversation. You know, the time that Bob Dylan said this, you know, <laughs> and it's a very nicely polished anecdote. And that's, that's also just the way life is. Um, and it's a problem dealing, interviewing people, especially older people. So the older people get, the more they do that. With Bob's story, did you come across people that were using your discussion with them as an opportunity to sort of push their own uh, potentially disingenuous uh, narrative? Did you, did you find people who were, you know, uh, may, maybe Bob wronged them or maybe somebody in the story wronged them? You know, what, what did you do when you came across someone you identified as not being particularly honest? Not maybe outright lying to you, but w was bending the truth to sort of suit their own uh, uh, place in the story? Well, if it's obviously not true, you just would ignore it. Right. If, if it's a kind of, if it's got some emotional weight, so for instance, Victor Maymoudes, Bob's road manager for years and probably knew him better than almost anyone. Yeah. By the time I met him in um, LA in 1999, he was bitter. He was a bitterly, bitterly angry man and he hated Bob Dylan. And so he said his conversation was very bitter. It, even more so than in his published, posthumous, posthumously published memoir, The Joker and the Thief, I think it's called. He, he really said nasty things about Bob Dylan, personal things, sexual things, actually, Ooh. which I didn't, I didn't put in the book. Yeah. But some of it I did put in, some of the things I, he said I did put in because there, you could feel his anger. You know, you could feel his, his really dislike, this pent-up dislike, which was genuine. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you you didn't always know and he would and he would also leave things out so victor wasn't a very nice guy in some respects but he would kind of skirt around the things that he had done on the road which weren't very nice and perhaps you know um unpleasant and he would say what a what a shit bob dylan is you know some of it was funny though i mean and, yeah. and I, you know like he doesn't clean his teeth you know he's got terrible bo um you know when you speak yeah. to him you know, you've got to kind of cover your mouth because he stinks i mean now is that true is that literally true i think there's a there's a bit of truth in it but you've got to be a bit careful well actually that gives us a good opportunity i'm going to pitch to chris chris has a couple of questions for you so uh chris you can go uh, go ahead and from here hey yeah thanks i so you mentioned bob's hygiene um, and one of the things I, I, I'm interested in is, um, and, and I know that there's a number of people who have spoken about his, his, his bad breath, right? I'm wondering, in, in the early 2000s, it became kind of clear that his enunciation uh, when he was uh, recording, or maybe not recording, but during his live performances, at least, and I actually saw him, I think, in 03, very difficult to understand him. Was there anything that you found that actually corroborated the fact that like he may have had some very bad issues with like his oral health that actually could have impacted his ability to enunciate like clearly, you know, I think sometimes we thought we think of things as like being a stylistic choice. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that you found that indicates that maybe he actually had some severe oral health issues at that time. Well, I know he had extensive dentistry because I, I interviewed his dentist. Um, oh, wow. you know, it's, in the, it's in the book. You, you know that's in the book so but of course you know of course he did um and his mother had to drag him to the dentist there's a whole story in the book about that um and in fact if you look at his teeth in the pictures you know he hasn't got his, the teeth he has now aren't the teeth he, he had when he was 21 right you, 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 the same is true of keith richards i mean he's got showbiz teeth right so the old teeth are gone they're covered up by showbiz teeth but i don't i've never i don't know about this thing about it affecting his voice i mean to me his voice which is very particular and his speaking voice his diction yeah. which is very very particular and very affected um is the same as it was when he was 21 i mean it's kind of a development but it's not it's not impaired in fact he speaks in that very particular i mean listen to the theme time radio hour he speaks beautifully, actually. He's got a wonderful delivery, very expressive, you know, nuanced, wonderful, warm speaking voice, but it's very, very affected. You know, it's not, it's not the way he was brought up to speak. Absolutely. It's not the, it's certainly not a rural Minnesota uh, accent by no. any stretch of the imagination. It's a kind of, it's a, it's, it's, it's his idea of Woody Guthrie, you know, really, which right. has kind of morphed into, this um, this sort of uh, wise old man type right. thing, you know, but it's very, uh, very, very particular. Uh, you mentioned your biography of uh, Charles Bukowski, of whom I'm also a, a great fan. Um, I was wondering, and I, I know that you approach your, these works as more strictly a biographer, less as like a literary critic, um, but I'm wondering your, your opinion of Bukowski, the poet versus Dylan, the poet. Well, um, I would I would say what Bob Dylan would say is that um, Bob Dylan would say, well, Charles Bukowski wrote um, poems to be published in books for people to read at home and maybe for him to read out at poetry readings. But primarily, he's a he's, he, he writes for the print press and that's poetry. Right. That's been a writer. Right. Bob Dylan uh, writes songs to be performed. And that's that's not the same. That's performance. Um, and in fact, reading Bob Dylan's poems on or his lyrics as poetry doesn't really they're not they're not as effective on the page as they are when he sings them and they're not meant to be um read on the page it's a bit like I mean a highfalutin example which Bob Dylan himself has made which rings true though is Homer you know if you've ever read Homer's Odyssey or the Iliad um I mean it's readable and it's you know it's, in, it's a great work of literature but it wasn't meant to be read. It was meant, there was some guy who came, stood up after dinner in, you know, ancient Greece. And he, he told this story. He it told it's a narrative. It was dramatic. It was after dinner entertainment. It wasn't something you read in bed at night. And that's what Bob Dylan does. And that's the very, and that's the difference between poetry and being a songwriter. 
No, that 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 makes sense. And I won't ask you to follow up on Tarantula or the liner notes, the Highway 61 visited, um, yeah. which, yeah, I know it's a, it's a very different medium. Um, you also, I, I, and I haven't had a chance to read it, I know you wrote a, a biography of Lou Reed and also a great fan since my teenage years of both Bob Dylan and Lou Reed. I'm very interested did you come across any anecdotes or anything in terms of the opinion of Lou Reed on Bob Dylan or Bob Dylan on Lou Reed? Um, oh, yeah, but that, that's in the book. I mean, I can't remember. I mean, off the top of my head, but Lou Reed, who was a nasty bastard, um, you know, he was uh, just a contrary, difficult, unhappy, neurotic character. Quite different to Bob Dylan, actually. Um, he, he said some disobliging things about Bob Dylan. In fact, some anti-Semitic things, both Jewish. But, you know, but Lou Reed was this kind of a man who didn't like himself. He wasn't happy in himself. And, he's, and he was mean and nasty about everyone, including Bob Dylan. Um, and um, whereas Bob um, was very complimentary and kind to, to show kindness and good, good nature towards Lou Reed. Speaking of nasty bastards, or, or what I assume would be, um, I, I understand that you had the opportunity to speak with William Zanzinger. Yeah, and I'm just very interested. I mean, as I as a kid listening to uh, the Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, I mean, he was like this great villain in my mind, and and you know, yeah. kind of gave me a social awareness. And so I'm just I'm interested in hearing about that. Yeah, well, me too. You know, because when I first I listened to Bob Dylan, my best friend was learning the acoustic guitar, and he would have the Bob Dylan songbook, and he would play um, the Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, and I would sit listening to him. And of course, the name William Zanzinger is so distinctive. He is, he's become a kind of mythical character. And this is the difference between uh, Bob Dylan writers generally and me as a biographer. So when I come to write my Bob Dylan book, you know, I don't just kind of write 400 words about the Lines and Death of Hattie Carroll. My instinct is to find William Zanzinger, which nobody else it seems are bothered to do. But it's not that difficult. It wasn't that difficult. He, he was in the phone book. But all these other Dylan writers hadn't bothered to check. And in 1999, in the Maryland phone book, there was the very distinctive name, William Zanzinger. So one morning I rang him up and I said, hello, Mr. Zanzinger, uh, Howard Soon's here, write a biography of Bob Dylan. He said, that son of a bitch. And of course, I really knew I had the right man. And I said, yeah, Bob Dylan. He said, I should have sued that son of a bitch and put him in jail. And I said, oh, really? Why is that, Mr. Sanzinger? And he said, well, wow, that son of a bitch, he, he's a bastard. He's a, he's, a, he's a no good son of a bitch, like, you know, lying. He goes off in this rant, this angry. You could imagine his face going bright red in Maryland. And, and I was taping this, you know, I, I had a tape bug uh, and I taped the whole thing. And I spoke to him. And my, meth, my method in such a conversation would be to sort of play the, um, you know, oh, really? You know, you know, calling from England, you know, terribly polite oh I'm, su I'm surprised you feel like that Mr Zanzinger and of course he just screams and shouts and rages and eventually he gets so he gets so worked up he kind of explodes and slams the phone down um, but by then I've got this really actually unique tape of this madman this racist madman talking about this historical case which which makes a nice paragraph in the book and in fact we turned that into a BBC radio documentary called The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll which you can still hear, hear online. Are you who philosophize disgrace? As a lifelong admirer of Bob Dylan's music, this is a song I've known since I was a boy. As Dylan's biographer, it is a song I had to address when I wrote Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan, in 2000. I wondered what Zanzinger thought of the song. Was he still alive? I found him listed in the Maryland phone book. You got him. Uh, is that William Zanzinger? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. My name is Howard Soons. I'm calling you from uh, London, England. As soon as I introduced myself, he began to rant and rave about how Dylan had defamed him. He's no cat, son of a bitch. Uh, I will look that up, and I will, if I find the link, I will include that in uh, the notes of this episode. That's, that's excellent. Okay, and then the, la the last question I have for me, I, I was just wondering, I, there's at least one instance of Bob Dylan referencing the fact that he used heroin in the early 60s, I think his first, when he first reached New York. And there have been other biographers, or at least one biographer, who I, I won't 
mention by name, who has indicated that Bob may have used heroin during the late 70s and early 80s during his Christian trilogy. And I was just wondering, I, they point to like some textual references within the works as well. I'm just wondering, is, have you, did you find, and I, sorry if this is a little salacious, did you find any evidence of that during that time period that he was using either heroin specifically or perhaps other harder drugs? Well, that's, that's the sort of thing I wouldn't say lightly. You know, right. I wouldn't say that lightly. I can't remember what's in the book about those drugs in particular. You'd have to look that up. And whatever's in the book is what I is, was my was my was my knowledge. What I felt I could prove. Whatever I said about drugs in the book is is as far as I felt legally able to go. And I wouldn't dream, for instance, I wouldn't dream of assuming someone takes heroin because of some cryptic reference in a lyric. That's right. the sort of thing that idiots like. Um, that dreadful bin man used to do, um, you know, the garbology idiot. Yes, you know, that's, Weberman. That's Weberman. That's the the, the name I wasn't going to say. It no, is that's, like, like, I'm that's, that, that's for the birds, as Americans say, you know. Absolutely. You don't say, you don't, no one serious with a reputation and a career says, says X, Y, and Z is taking heroin unless you can prove it. You know, that's a stupid, that's a stupid, irresponsible thing to do. So um, that's my view of that. I think that's very fair. And I think that's why yours is the definitive biography. But so thank you. Well, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. All I would say is that it's, it's a biography, you know, it's properly researched. It's not, it's not 300 pages of, of off, top, off the top of my head crap. You know, it's, it's properly researched, vigorously researched as much as, as much as I could, as much as I could, it is, you know, and, it, and nothing's perfect. You know, one isn't, I'm not saying it's the, the best book that's ever going to be written about Bob Dylan you know, there may be a better one. I don't, I don't know one yet, to be honest, but, you know, there's still time for, for a better book to be written. Well, one quality of, of your book that uh, I appreciate is that it's sort of ongoing. You've, you've done, I think, two revisions, and the latest one brings it up to the new updated edition, brings the reader up to Bob's 80th birthday. So you've been continually writing about Bob in the last 20 years. What would you say is the most fascinating aspect of Bob's late era career? Something you would have written about in these last 20 years? Yeah, well, I, I'm i very impressed by his late career, really. I mean, I'm, you don't forget, I really, I'm someone who really loves Bob Dylan's music. And yeah. I love the music of the Rolling Stones and um, Joni Mitchell and Lou Reed and lots of people uh, like Leonard Cohen. But generally speaking, rock stars tend to do their best work when they're young and then they, try, then they become a greatest hits act. And right. Bob Dylan really hasn't been, he's really, he, he's really shown his genius by creating albums like Time Out of Mind and Rough and Rowdy Ways, which are really, really good. And so it's wonderful to see him now and those added chapters at the end where there's really good work going on. I mean, when I first listened to Bob Dylan in my youth, he was going through his sort of born again gospel phase where he seemed to have lost. Then he went for those sort of lost years of knocked out loaded and down in the groove and all that stuff where he really looked like he was a has been actually. But, but now you see the real quality of the man um, and he seems even more impressive to me, actually, because one of the one of the hallmarks of somebody who's really good is that they keep being good. They don't just fizzle out or repeat themselves. So someone like Bob Dylan or, or is like a, a Picasso. He's he's good right to the end, and he's innovative right to the end, which is extraordinarily unusual. Yeah, you mentioned rough and rowdy ways. Chris and I were lucky enough to see the opening show of the new tour he's doing, it opened here in Milwaukee of all places. And we went to that, which was terrific. Have you had a chance to see him on this latest run? No, I'd, I'd love to. He's coming to Europe in the autumn. And if he comes to London, I'll go. But I mean, I've seen it on YouTube. It looks, I think it looks, what, what was it like? It looks great. Well, yeah, it, he sounded really good. Uh, the set list was packed full of new songs, which I always think is impressive. I always think that that's bold when an artist, you know, really leans into their newest stuff instead of relying on the old hits. 
he did almost nothing from, you know, his you know, heyday or whatever. Uh, but that wasn't a downside. I think we really enjoyed the, the new stuff, and that's why we like the new record. So I guess, you know, he's only done two albums of original material in the last 10 years. If this, you know, God forbid, is his final release, do you think that's a, a really good, you know, swan song, a good note to go out on? Yeah. Yeah, Rough and Rowdy Right Ways is good record. Um, um, yeah. Um, and uh, the shows look really intense and yeah. dignified. And I mean, I, I would love to see him. You know, I, I'm not such a big fan that I would get on a plane to go to the States just to see a show. I'm, right. not, that, I'm not that kind of a fan. But if he's playing down the road, <laughs> I'll go. Right. And I, How and many I would, times have you seen him? Well, I, a lot, actually, because I started seeing him in 81 and I saw a lot of the shows when I was researching the book and I, and I saw him, I saw, I've seen him all over the world, funny enough, I, but I don't, I, don't, I don't do what fans, I see fans on, there's a website called Expecting Rain. You know, these guys who kind of go to every show, I've, I've never been that oh. sort of person. I'm, I'm not that kind of, again, I, I, I mentioned my, my, my nemesis, uh, Clinton Halen. I imagine him at every show, you know, with his notepad and his little satchel, you know, and um, I, I find that a bit ridiculous, yeah. to be honest. But um, I think those shows where he's at the piano with that, it's so wonderful and moving and dignified to see an older artist doing that. I just saw Rolling Stones in London a few days ago, and you, Mick Jagger is wonderful, but he's pretending to be young, and he's 70, mm -hmm. 78 years old. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. You know, he's a 78 year old trying to pretend he's 25. Yeah. Bob Dylan is, is living the life of an 81 year old. As he, and that's very, I think, quite moving and wonderful. And, and there was a moment in the show that we saw where he did step out from behind the piano and he steadied himself on the mic stands, but he, he actually danced a little bit, but not in an undignified fashion. It was very charming. Yeah, he is charming, uh, isn't he? Yeah. I've, always, I've always found him to be a very charming, you know, almost lovable, really, lovable yeah. person. Yes. Funny, Absolutely. you know, funny. He's so funny. And he got, he's got so much humanity. You know, rock stars aren't famed for the humanity and wit and intelligence, but he's got all of that in spades. That has been a consistent theme through all of our Dylan-centric episodes, is that we have found how consistently funny he is going back from the 60s in his lyrics, in his interviews, and I guess even in his performances. He, and, he, and it's like he doesn't get really the credit for like that aspect of it. Humor is hugely important, and he's got a very good sense of it. Any, any really good artist, good writer, has got a sense of humor because, you know, things that are funny are true. Um, and, you know, you, you read any writer, I mean, I can think of a couple of exceptions, but generally speaking, a great, great writers often are funny. As, yep. as well as, you know, not always funny. I mean, he can be very serious, very dark, but he, he's kind of alive to the absurdity of life and the wonder of life. And that's, and that's part of why he's so great, really. Yeah. Now, you said the first time you saw him was back in 81 when he was doing his, you know, revival Christian tour. I had a, another uh, Dylan uh, author on, a guy named Keith Miles, and he said he first saw Bob uh, right around that same time. And he said at the time he did not appreciate the music that Bob was doing because he was young and he was a rock fan. But, you know, now that he's older, he looks back with some sort of regret about having, you know, that reaction because he loves that Christian era now. Did you have a similar experience or how did you feel the first couple of times you saw him? Oh, exactly the same. And I presume that was the same tour, which would be the Shot of Love tour from 81, yeah. where he played Earl's Court in London, which is a huge kind of conference center place. And he I think he about, did mention that, yeah. Yeah, he played about eight nights and the, you know, it was like 15,000 people a night. Um, and I was 16, and I, I was an atheist. I mean, I'm still an atheist, but I was a kind of, at 16, I kind of thought, you know, atheism is truth, man, you know. And anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is, a, is an idiot. So when Bob Dylan came on stage and started singing to me about Jesus Christ, I, I felt, you know, I felt my hero had kind of had fallen, you know, into disgrace. And I was bored, 
and and, uh, and I was waiting for him to play. Um, he did, of course, he did play Ballad of a Thin Man, and at the end he did an encore of uh, It's All Right, Ma. And by then I was right up at you know to the stage with my friend, and we were like standing right under the stage, and and it was very exciting. But I had no time for In the Garden and and all that stuff. But of course now. I realized that Trouble No More, for instance, that album, Trouble No More, the live bootleg album, that's one of his great albums. And some of those songs were recorded, that tour. And, you know, even putting aside the religious dogma, which I find unpalatable, there's a great deal of artistry there and honesty. And he, he sang those songs with such commitment, you know, really put his heart and soul into them. Great band, you know, Jim Keltner, Tim Drummond, I mean, Carolyn Dennis and you know, Clyde e. King and all those people. He was fantastic, but it was pretty bizarre to see this guy who you'd kind of idolized, you know, age 16. I thought he was like a sort of, I thought he was sort of on the, I thought he was Jack Kerouac and Bob Dylan and all my kind of dreams of romantic dreams of the America of America, really incarnate. And here he was telling me about Jesus Christ, you know, I mean, it was, it was shocking. Do you remember how the crowd reacted? Did he did he preach? We've heard bootlegs of him trying to preach from the stage. Do you have any memories of that? Yeah, no, well, that was he, he did do that, but not that tour. Uh, oh, the, crowd, okay. Okay. the crowd, the crowd, like me, was pretty had no time for the new stuff. Of course, rock crowds never do. Yeah, and that's funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but when he when he but then he knew that. Of course, he knew that. Uh, yeah. knew, so so when he did. Um, in the garden or pressing on great wonderful songs everyone was bored and kind of oh my god you know very brief clapping and then he would after two or three of those then he would give us um, battle of a thin man or masters of war and of course everyone perks up because they've heard of that one mm -hmm. and everyone's suddenly happy you know um so he you know he, he knew that but that you know there were kind of big empty areas in in earl's court now th three years yeah. earlier he played earl's court on a, on a celebrated tour to promote the album Street Legal. And he was the hippest thing in the world then, you know, and those, those shows were sellouts. In 81, there were kind of empty gaps. People went to the bar. People were kind of, you know, oh, my God, you know, Bob Dylan's got God. What the joke was, Bob Dylan's found Jesus. It's Jesus's fault. He should have hid better. <laughs> okay, well... You mentioned uh, your your nemesis, Clinton Halen, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask one question about him because I got to say, I didn't realize there was a little beef between you guys. Uh, and for those listening who don't know, last year, Clinton Halen said some really cruel things about both you personally and your book. He is a fellow Dylan author. He's written many books about Bob. Do you have any idea what his problem is, where all this vitriol is coming from? Well, I mean, I think he's a ridiculous person, and I think he's a terrible <laughs> writer. I mean, he's, yeah. oh. I don't see him as a writer. I see him as a fan. He yeah. somehow parlayed this, this fan-like devotion to Bob Dylan into a, a kind of niche career as a Dylan biographer. To me, he doesn't write biography. He writes fan-type books. Now, that doesn't matter. In fact, the first book he did, Behind the Shades, was a pretty decent book. I mean, it was, I don't remember the, the source notes being very revealing. It seemed to be a kind of scrapbook of what everyone else had somehow said somewhere else, which he kind of pull, pull, pulled together. But nonetheless, it was an entertaining book, and it wasn't a bad book. Um, but he then got very jealous and suspicious of me when I wrote Down the Highway, because Down the Highway was a very successful book, commercially yeah. successful and he was pretty pissed off that this guy had come out of nowhere from a journalist background. And in fact, I'd been in tabloid journalism, which is looked down upon. Oh, yeah. And he was very kind of sniffy about that. And he said some very actually untrue things about me. In one version of, of, of Behind the Shades, he says, I used to work for the Sun newspaper. I've never in my life worked for the Sun newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he can't even get his facts right. But in, the latest ver in his latest opus, this dreadful thing called... Um, I don't even know what it's called, this terrible thing he's written, which is just this awful, clunky, self-indulgent book. He kind of, he, he refers to me so rudely and gratuitously and at such length. Yeah. I, I was amazed. I was in this, and I look, looked in the, in the index of this book and I um, realized I was in this book more than Bruce Springsteen. You know, there's more <laughs> entries to Howard Soons than Bruce Springsteen in the S's. 
And I thought, this guy is, you know, he's, he's, he's an idiot. And I complained to his publisher. And uh, when the publisher kind of shrugged their shoulders, I spoke to the Guardian newspaper in England and told them what I thought of him. Um, and, I, my, and my opinion of him is pretty low, actually. Uh, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't air that if he hadn't, if he hadn't started it. You know, if he, if he'd had the good manners to keep his absurd ideas about other writers, his kind of jealous paranoia of other writers to himself. He, his whole thing has been the Dylan expert. That's his whole thing, which is specious and nonsense. And he's very suspicious of anybody else. He wasn't the first Dylan writer, and he won't be the last. And I, and I, and he certainly isn't the best. Um, you know, I mean, he really isn't the best. Right. Well, yeah. he's, he's not a good writer. I mean, he, he writes very bad prose. Uh, and he's not a journalist, so he doesn't really kind of research things in, in a vigorous way. He just kind of real, and he overwrites. You know, overwriting is one of the marks of a bad writer. You know, professional writers are succinct and they edit themselves. Ba bad writers, you know, if your grandpa writes his life story, he will overwrite it, you know. Uh, a professional writer writes a life story, you use the, the fewest words possible to make a point. You don't keep repeating yourself. Should and we? You, uh, and, you don't, and, you, and you don't attack other writers because um, they're gonna, they're gonna, as I am now, they're gonna, say, they're gonna say nasty things back. And you know, so here I am again saying that he's a terrible writer and I, and I, I would urge people not to buy his terrible books. <laughs> Joe, maybe we should wrap up a copy of uh, Strunk and White's Elements of Style and, uh, and, and post it over to uh, Clinton Halen. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a kind of curious thing that two of the leading Dylan writers, I suppose, in the world, oddly enough, are both British yep. and both have these American first names. I mean, it's occurred to me that I'm Howard and I'm British and Halen is Clinton and he's British. <laughs> um, and that's a sort of slightly, uh, maybe that's, that's just a coincidence. Although there is, there is an element of it, there is an interesting element there whereby I think people abroad out of the States kind of see Dylan with more reverence than people in America do. Oh, yes. I, I, think, I think that is absolutely spot on. Dylan is not the only person you've written books about, right? And you've written books about other people who other authors have also written about. Is this some, is this dynamic with you and Clinton somewhat common in the writing world? Have you had any sort of experiences uh, with other authors of people who wrote books about Lou Reed or McCartney or Bukowski or anything like that? Oh yeah, I mean, I think writers generally are jealous of each other. Yeah, okay. I mean, because you're like, you're on, you're on each other's turf and you're competitors, but, the protocol is that you don't express that. You don't, you don't put that in your book. I mean, if you look in my book, my Bob Dylan biography, I, I politely acknowledge Clinton Halen's books, and I don't, I don't comment on them. I don't say he's a terrible writer. I'm telling you this now, because he, because he, cause, but it's not in the book. I mean, I would never dream of saying that in the book, because it's it makes you look cheap. So yeah. So when I wrote, uh, I've written biography. So when I wrote. You know, all, all my biographies, you know, if you're going to write a biography of any one of any significance, somebody else has either done it or they're going to do it, you know, yeah. because if no one's writing about them, then they're not worth writing about. Um, but you don't, you don't talk about it, you know, express it. It's like, um, it's like kind of, uh, you know, being in love with two guys being in love with the same woman, you know, you, know, you don't talk about that kind of thing. You just, you just try and win. You just try and win that fight. You don't talk about it. It's un undignified. And it's am amateurish. Yeah. I recall reading Down the hot Highway, and you did cite, you know, Halen's works before. And I always, when I read the book, I, I just assumed you guys were peers and there wasn't any beef. So that's why this news last year uh, surprised me. I will say I did read Behind the Shades, and I think what you said is spot on. I found it to be overly long and dry and... And, and bizarrely opinionated in places where it didn't need to be opinionated. And that sort well, of takes I mean, me as a reader yeah. out of the story. He's got, a, he's got a great weakness for telling people what he thinks. You yeah. know? And the truth is, no one gives a shit what he thinks. Yeah. You know, we're trying to talk about the man and his life, or I am, I, yeah. Bob Dylan. I don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't care what I think of the songs. I mean, what I think of the songs isn't neither here nor there. 
um, songs speak for themselves. What I can do as the biographer is reveal the man's life yeah. um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, in a crafted way. So it makes sense as a story. So if you read down the highway, you kind of get a feeling for who this man is as a person. You know, you kind of get a sense of, you know, this is what he's really like. This is how he lives. How he's, this is how he's become who he is. Um, but it's not literary. It's not, um, you know, in it, it's not um, high school literary criticism. Right. I find well, that rather. I find that rather pathetic, really. I mean, someone like Christopher Ricks, so Christopher Ricks can indulge in that because he's a an Oxford don of the highest, you know, standing in the world of um, academia. But some some pissant Bob Dylan nut, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't give a shit what they think about Bob Dylan's music. Yeah, Christopher well, Ricks is that Dylan's vision is of sin, right? Was yeah. The, so, so, Chris, so, so Christopher Ricks is what it was in his day. One of the greatest English um, liter literature professors in the world. Uh, you know, he's a very significant person. Um, but, you know, uh, many Bob Dylan books are written by very insignificant people. Well, strictly speaking of the book, you are right. I don't care what the author thinks of various Dylan songs. But I will say for the purposes of this interview, I do care about uh, what you think of, of some of Bob's work. You know, you've been working on some form of this book for like over 20 years now. You know, you, we, you talk about you were a fan, you still are a fan. Because of how Bob has been in your life professionally, are you still able to enjoy, you know, all of the music you, that you love from Bob without it making you think of work? Yeah, not really. Um, the truth is, if you write a biography like this, if you spend two and a half years every single day thinking about Bob Dylan, you can't listen to it afterwards. You know, I can't read Charles Bukowski anymore. I can't listen to Lou Reed anymore because I've, I've had it up to here, you know? Right. Now, with Bob Dylan, it's a little bit different because it's a long time ago. Um, by and large, I don't listen to his stuff anymore, but I, I did listen to Rough and Rowdy Ways, partly because I had to, because I was going to write about it, but I listen to it with enjoyment, but I, I won't tend to go home and play it because I've, and also some of the songs are so familiar to me that I, I've lost the element of surprise, you know, I mean, I don't want to, I never want to hear like a Rolling Stone again, you know, because I've heard it too often, you know, yeah, uh, live and on record. I never want to hear it again. You know, I wouldn't, the, the blown in the wind, which was just uh, re-recorded, you know, I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested. Because uh, I'm, I'm satiated by that, you know, I've had, I've really, so it does ruin you, actually, it does ruin, it does kill your love of the work, but I, I still really admire the man. Very interesting. Yeah, I would think that has to be very commonplace with, with uh, authors. So, well, there, there has to be some that maybe have, have broke through. Are there still some Dylan tracks that despite all these years of work and, you know, the baggage that comes with it, are there still some Dylan tracks that stand out to you as, as still personally very meaningful? Yeah. Well, um, I'll give you two examples. Um, a classic from his early days is um, Just Like Tom Thumbs Blues, which I love because it's, it's the best of early Bob Dylan to me. It's Bob evoking a story like a novelist, you know, and you can feel yourself in his shoes in this kind of slightly wonderful novelistic scene. And I love that song. And I, and I would have that on my, as one of my Desert Island Discs, you know, the BBC radio yeah. team show. And then when I researched the book, the, the, the album that was current was Time Out of Mind when I first wrote the book, the first edition of the book. And I, of course I listened to that endlessly and I saw him on, on tour all the time. So I heard him play those songs all the time. And I was very, very moved by them. And because and I was kind of immersed in them, that I was really focused on him, you know, for those two years, I was completely obsessed with this subject, which you have to be to write a good book. You know, you have to be completely obsessed. When it's over, it's over. It's like, you've done your exams, you can forget all your algebra. But in the moment, you're obsessed. You know, you, you live an obsessive existence. Um, the, the song that really moved me was Highlands. Uh, because I, I personally felt elements of my life, that, and that's true of everybody with all great songs. You know, you see yourself reflected. And there's a line in there um, where he sings, um, I, I'm lost somewhere. I, fear, I feel I've made a few bad turns. 
and I and and you know I felt that way about my own life actually, um, in some respects, and and that moved me, and and it still moves me. And I and one one night I was uh, in Santa Cruz when he played that um, song, and he doesn't play that song very often. It's a very long, twelve minute song, and and that was a very powerful experience. It's, it's very powerful to be close to a great artist in a small venue where you can really feel the music kind of making your rib cage reverberate and you can see him and you, you can look him in the eye, you know, and you, you know, you can't do that with the Rolling Stones in Hyde Park or Madison Square yep. Garden, but you can do it with Bob Dylan at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium in 1999. And that was a very powerful and sort of wonderful experience. And I don't ever think, I don't think ever, I, I'll ever have a better experience really than that. And also that, that same year I saw him at the, I saw him in, in Duluth at the Bayfront Festival. I was right up close. And, you know, he's playing his hometown. He's born in Duluth, of course. And there's always something special about seeing an artist in their hometown because they make more of an effort, you know, because they're playing to their, you know, they're impressing the hometown. And again, that was the, that was time out of mind era. And so Love Sick and um, Cold Irons Bound. I loved those songs. I thought they were very, very meaningful and personal, obviously personal to him. And they kind of had a universal kind of weariness about them, what it's like to get older. I find that very, one of his great uh, selling points, that he's very good about what it's like to get older and, you know, maturing and having regrets, which is very much a part of life, actually. But it's not something that's generally speaking part of pop music. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try the flip side. When you look back on Bob's discography and you remember writing about various points in his career, what are the songs or albums or eras or however you'd want to put it that you would describe that to you personally are his low points? What is the real... There, there is some junk in his discography. What was the stuff that would be the toughest for you to listen to? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess it's the same things that everyone would say. Knocked Out Loaded, um, Down in the Groove, Empire Burlesque. But it, with all of those albums, there's at least one good track. Um, but, you know, they were so disappointing. Dylan and the Dead, oh, my God. Oh. I mean, Dylan <laughs> and the Dead is a shocker, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's got a good album cover. I like the artwork. It's good, well, it's a good example of never judge something by the cover. It's got a good cover. You're right. It's a really Spot crappy on. album. Yeah, that is too funny. Okay. Well, uh, my, my last question for you is, again, about the extent of your research. In your... Uh, writing process, I imagine you had many challenges. Was the hardest challenge that you faced while writing this book watching the film Hearts of Fire? Yeah, well, <laughs> I went to the premiere of Hearts of Fire as a journalist when it came Did out. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, Lon in London's glittering West End, with all the, okay. all the stars, all the stars showed up, including celebrities from the world of entertainment, Everyone showed up apart from Bob Dylan. And I, oh. I, was at, I was at the party afterwards in some London nightclub. And there were people like uh, members of 10CC and uh, movie actors walking around saying, is Bob? Where's Bob? Right. And, of course, <laughs> when I eventually met Victor Maymoudis, uh, Victor was with him that weekend in London. And he said, Bob gave his tickets out to a tramp in the street. Because oh. he, knew, he, knew he, he knew he'd made the worst film ever. And I said to Victor, why did he make this fucking terrible film? Yeah. You know, and Victor said, he said, he's got the same vanities as we all have. He wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> and my goodness me, what a terrible, terrible film that was. I can't think of one redeeming... F uh, and the music is awful. The only good you, thing you about were, You weren't big film, on the music? Yeah. Did, did you not like him doing the usual... No. I thought that was, well, that was okay. Yeah. yeah. But the rest of it, yeah. The Tears for Fears cover and Fiona, oof. <laughs> well, it's one of those films where you know from the first frame it's going to be crap. <laughs> yeah. it, looked, it looked crap right from the start, that toll booth scene. You, you really thought, oh, shit, this is going to be. It's also one of those films that's incredibly boring. You know, yeah. it, 90 minutes, it feels like it's 180 minutes. 
and you can't wait for it to end. There are some f- unintentionally funny moments, but you have to wait for such long chunks in between those that it's it's really not worth it. I guess the only really interesting thing about the movie is that he says that weird line about the Nobel Prize. You know, I guess I was known as never one of them rock and roll singers that was going to win any Nobel Prize. Is that what you call it? Nobel Prize? Yeah, I guess. You remember that? I forgot that. Does he? Does he? Yeah. He says, he says, I'm not going to be one of those rock stars that wins a Nobel Prize. And then all these years later, he gets awarded the Nobel Prize. So I think that's really the, the only kind of, you know, notable thing about the movie. Um, Howard, this has been awesome meeting you. Can you tell us, do you have any uh, projects on the future that you would like anybody to know about? Or I, I know you did a podcast a couple of years ago that uh, got some attention. You know, what are you up to? I've got a new book out called This Woman, which is a crime book. I write crime books as well. And um, it's not published in the States yet, but I'm sure you can buy it. It's called This Woman. It's a a prison story about the British murderer, Myra Hindley. So, you know, I don't just write about music. I write, I just just like a good story, really. Um, So that's my new book. And that was published just recently, this, 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 this year. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, I just got to say, Down the Highway was such an incredible read and such a fantastic resource for me and Chris during our our Dylan episodes. I have read so many rock biographies, and almost none of them even approach the amount of research and work that clearly went into yours. I genuinely believe this is one of the best rock bios or music bios I've ever read. It was a treat talking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks to you both. I really enjoyed it. Nice to speak to you. Excellent. Okay. And that was Howard Soons, author of Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. Again, the new updated edition was released in 2021, and it brings the reader up to Bob's 80th birthday. You can get your copy at Amazon.com. If you want to learn more about Howard or the other books he's written, including the ones we discussed in this interview, you can check out his website, howardsoons.com. You can also follow Howard on Twitter, at Howard Soons. I need to thank Howard for being such a fantastic guest, and I can't overstate how much I recommend this biography. Truly an impressive piece of work and a must-read for any Dylan fan and really any fans of good quality music journalism. It's a great biography. So go get yourself a copy. Until then, thanks for tuning in, and keep rocking. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the big four things you can do to support this show that don't cost a dime. Number one, listen to the show. If you're hearing this now, that means you did this part already. Thank you. There is an infinite amount of content out there, so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means a great deal to me. Number two, if you like what we did here, please recommend this show to family, friends, or anyone you know who's looking for a podcast, particularly about music. Share our links in Facebook groups, subreddits, and recommendation threads. Whatever you can do is highly appreciated on my end. Number three, find us on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Play That Podcast. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash play that podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash play that rock and roll. Lots of great material like photos and vlogs on all three platforms as play that rock and roll is very much meant to be a content hub as well as a podcast. And finally, the big ask. Number four, please give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I know this part is a hassle, but it really does help the show a great deal. Not just because it affects the algorithm, but also because it gives me something I can point to when pitching this show to potential guests. The more social media followers and positive ratings the show has, the better chance I have for booking high-profile guests for interviews. 
So if you take a moment to give us even just a five-star rating, you are actively giving us a tool to do bigger and better things here. But whatever the case, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great stories and music from the world of classic rock.